Welcome, everybody. We're thrilled to have you here today. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us. My name is Amanda Lewis, and I'm the director of UIC's Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy. It is my pleasure today to welcome you to the annual Philip J. Bowman Lecture on Race, Ethnicity, and Public Policy. Um, the Bowman Lecture focuses on providing timely analyses of issues of race, equity, and justice facing us today. The lecture is named after the first permanent director of the Institute, Philip J. Bowman, both because of his important leadership of the Institute and because of his prolific record as a scholar. All of us who have benefited from the work of IRPP over the last 15 or 20 years owe a debt of gratitude to Dr. Bowman for his careful and strategic nurturance of the Institute at its beginning. He set a strong foundation that has enabled IRRPP to serve its mission of supporting UIC faculty increasing the quantity, quality, and impact of research on race and policy, and serving as an important intellectual hub here in Chicago for cutting edge research on race and ethnic dynamics that is deeply engaged, not only with trying to understand, but trying to transform the conditions of underrepresented groups. Um, I will give Dr. Bowman his full introduction um, after the talk. We're thrilled to have him here today, and he's actually gonna be in conversation with our speaker um, after she's done and before the Q&A. Um, before introducing our speaker today, I would like to thank our staff um, and the campus community and all of our partners for making today possible um, and for help supporting all the work of the Institute. Um, I want to thank you for being with us today and encourage you to consider how your organizations can become collaborators in our work. Um, a few quick logistics. Um, the chat is turned off, but please put any questions you have in the Q&A. We'll be drawing on them at the end and we'll have time for questions. Um, we are recording the event. It will be shown on CAN TV on their YouTube page and on um, the live channel. Um, and we will post it on IRPP's site um, at irrpp.uic.eu as soon as it is available. Um, we're using Zoom's version of Light's transcript to caption the event. And although it's getting better, it's still not the best. And we apologize ahead of time for any unfortunate mistakes. Um, now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dorothy Brown. Um, professor Brown is the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Law at Emory University School of Law and an advocate for economic and social justice. A side note, she will very soon be heading off to Georgetown University to their school of law. They're very lucky to have her. She's the author of The Whiteness of Wealth, How the Tax System Impoverishes Black Americans and How We Can Fix It. That'll be the basis of her talk today. She is well known for her work in a wide variety of areas, the effects of tax policy by race, class, and gender, workplace equity and inclusion, and law school reform. She's also the author of the Pathbreaking Critical Race Theory, Cases, Materials, and Problems, currently in its third edition. Um, she has appeared on CNN, MSNBC, Bloomberg, and lots of news channels talking about her work and talking about issues of race and taxes, and has written numerous opinion pieces addressing current events for the New York Times, The Atlantic, CNN Opinion, Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she teaches a wide variety of classes um, at the law school and has been a, a recipient of a number of awards, including recently the Clyde Ferguson Award in 2008 from the um, American Association of Law Schools Minority Group Section to Outstanding, Outstanding Law Teachers. Personally, I just wanna say that Professor Brown is one of those invaluable colleagues who help make these institutions tolerable, if not occasionally fun places to work. Um, we overlapped at Emory for a while and we did as much as we could to cause what John Lewis often refers to as good trouble. Um, I'm thrilled to have her here and I'm so excited for her work and for this talk. Welcome, Professor Brown. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. I'm delighted to be here. Today, I wanna talk with you about the making of the whiteness of wealth, how institutions shape academic thought. Let's begin by traveling back in time to the early 1990s when I was on the faculty at George Mason Law School. One afternoon, I wanted to take a break from class prep and I've been saving a Law Review article for just such an occasion. It was an article written by my friend and mentor, the late Duke Law Professor Jerome Culp, toward a Black legal scholarship, race and original understandings. In it, he argued that all Black law professors should analyze whether race has anything to do with the area of law we teach. I had almost finished reading the article when I saw the following line. 
There may be an income tax problem that would benefit from being viewed in a black perspective, but until you look, how will anyone know? Before reading that article, it was inconceivable to me that tax law could operate differently based upon race. I picked tax law, or perhaps tax law picked me, so that I could get away from race. Growing up in the South Bronx and New York City and experiencing racism made me feel angry, frustrated, and powerless. Specializing in an area of the law that I believed had nothing to do with race seemed like a very good idea. Tax law was all about numbers, and I love numbers. Numbers are neutral and objective. Green was the only relevant color, right? But that afternoon, I began to question everything. After I finished reading the article, I called Jerome and made him a promise. I would look to see if tax laws impact taxpayers differently depending upon their race. Keeping that promise was another question. It was not easy because it was then that I discovered neither the Internal Revenue Service nor the Treasury Department published statistics by race. I think it's important to pause for a moment and reflect on that. If the tax experts do not publish the data, then any racially disparate impact will continue unabated, invisible, hidden from the naked eye. Further, the absence of tax data by race reinforces the idea that taxes are colorblind. As you know, many government agencies routinely provide race data, but not the Treasury or the IRS. What my decades-long research shows is that when Black and white Americans engage in the same activities, tax policy subsidizes white Americans while disadvantaging Black Americans and results in their financial death by a thousand cuts every April 15th. That means we have to rely on this academic's quixotic journey over the last 25 years. So let's talk about my journey. The first thing I ever wrote about race and tax was the last thing that went into my tenure file at Cincinnati. Spoiler alert, I got tenure. That piece was a chapter in a book called Taxing America and was published by NYU Press. My chapter, The Marriage Bonus Penalty in Black and White, looked at how husbands and wives contributed their income to the household and the impact that the operation of the joint return had on their tax bill. The chapter talked about how white married couples were more likely to have one wage earner in the paid labor market and one stay-at-home spouse. Those households received a tax cut when they got married. We call that the marriage bonus. On the other hand, couples where husbands and wives earn equal amounts of income do not get a tax cut. Rather, their taxes are likely to increase. We call that a marriage penalty. Black married couples are more likely to have two equal wage earners and pay a marriage penalty. I followed up the book chapter with a more in-depth article, and I could only do it because I was on the faculty at the University of Cincinnati, and I had access to the university's Institute for Policy Research, which analyzed Census Bureau data for me as a proxy for taxable income. The research showed that regardless of income, black married couples pay higher taxes than white married couples because black married couples are more likely to live in equal wage earner households. Having the ironclad data helped support my goal of producing high quality research and would influence future work. My move to the faculty at Washington and Lee Law School would prove a pivotal step on my intellectual journey. It started with an offer to visit in the fall of 2001, and the dean asked me to teach a course in critical race theory. I thought, okay, let's do this, even though I'd never taught a course in critical race theory before. I wanted to put together an original set of materials, but first I had to figure out how I wanted to teach the class. I decided that I would put together materials on the first year curriculum in law school. Therefore, my seminar students in the second and third year would have all taken the first year courses. I put together separate chapters on torts, contracts, criminal law, criminal procedure, civil procedure, and property. Sounds like a great idea, right? 
except I don't teach first year courses. So between the time I accepted the visit and when I actually taught the course, I bugged every friend I had who taught first year law courses. They gave me cases. I was able to put together law review article excerpts. And in doing the research for the book, reading articles and getting immersed, it really opened my thinking about how to tackle the race and tax project that I had embarked upon in the mid 1990s. You will never think the same way about race and the law once you've read Cheryl Harris's Whiteness as Property. Ultimately, I put those materials together in my book, Critical Race Theory, and I'm currently working on the fourth edition. The next leap forward in my research occurred when I moved to Emory University, because it was there that I met amazing colleagues in other disciplines who taught me the value of other disciplines outside of law and resulted in my talking less and less to legal academics. I was appointed a co-director of the university's Race and Difference Initiative and worked closely with sociologists, including Amanda Lewis and Tyrone Foreman, as well as historians. As a result, my work became interdisciplinary and better. I learned how to ask different questions and came up with more nuanced answers. Historians made me ask, how did we get here? Sociologists made me think more deeply about the impact that a society built around anti-Black racism had on tax policy. Tyrone, for example, read a draft of my homeownership and race piece and sent me to the rich sociological research on race and homeownership. Political scientists made me ask more questions about why laws benefiting white Americans were enacted, but not laws benefiting others. Stratification economists taught me to think about economic inequality as a function of societal racism. Each of those disciplines taught me to ask more insightful questions that led to different revelations and ultimately to the whiteness of wealth. So the balance of my talk will be the fruits of that journey. My chapter on marriage, Married While Black, showed that tax subsidies for marriage benefit white Americans more than black Americans. The research reveals that African Americans are the least likely to marry. When we ma do marry, we do so later and spend less time married than white Americans. And we are the least likely to stay married. The majority of white Americans are married, the majority of black Americans are not. As a result, tax subsidies for marriage will disproportionately benefit the majority of white Americans. My research shows how subsidies for marriage disproportionately benefit white married couples while disadvantaging black married couples. It begins with the marriage bonus, which provides a tax cut for married couples in single wage earner households. The single wage earner pays less taxes on their joint return than the single wage earner would pay had they remained single. My research shows that single wage earner households are more likely to be found among white married couples. The marriage penalty, on the other hand, describes the tax increase for married couples when both work in the paid labor market. The marriage penalty is the greatest when married couples are in roughly equal wage earner households, when couples contribute 50-50 to household income. Those couples pay higher taxes when they get married than they would have paid had they remained single. My research shows that Black married couples are more likely to be equal wage earner couples than their white peers. In other words, tax policy decisions contribute to a married Black couple's inability to create more wealth. What we know of as the joint return did not exist at the beginning of our progressive tax system because taxpayers were taxed on their income as individuals. But in 1927, a rich white couple, Charlotte and Henry Seaborn, along with their lawyers, took matters into their own hands, effectively creating a joint return for themselves. Henry shifted half of his income to Charlotte, which lowered the overall taxes that the couple paid. The Internal Revenue Service objected, but the Seaborns took their case all the way to the Supreme Court, which rewarded their self-help with a win. 
That eventually led to Congress creating a joint return in 1948. But even in 1948, a higher percentage of black wives worked outside of the home than white wives, which meant it was entirely predictable that the joint return would lead to lower taxes for more married white couples than married black couples. It is referred to as equitable when we tax two households with $100,000 of income the same, whether that is the result of two wage earners or one. Systemic racism in the labor market, however, means that it often takes two married Black workers to equal one single white wage earner. Those households should not pay the same amount in taxes in a progressive tax system. That is the opposite of equity. A study of Black and white families over a 25-year period between 1984 and 2009 showed Getting married significantly increased the wealth holdings for white families by $75,000, but had no statistically significant impact on African Americans. I believe the marriage penalty disproportionately paid by Black married couples during those years is part of the reason why. And while the 2017 tax cuts temporarily eliminated the marriage penalty for many married couples, it did so by significantly increasing the marriage bonus and by leaving intact the significant marriage penalties found in earned income tax credit households. So even if a Black married couple does not pay higher taxes today, their white peers get a tax cut that they are ineligible for. In addition, the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act did not eliminate the marriage penalty for high income married couples. And there is a higher percentage of high income black married couples paying the marriage penalty when compared with their high income white peers. There is also a singles penalty in our tax laws. A single worker with $50,000 of income will pay higher taxes than a married couple with a single wage earner who earns $50,000 of income. The marginal tax rate, the, last, the, the highest tax rate that will apply to the last dollars of income for a single taxpayer earning $50,000 is 22%, compared with 12% for the married taxpayer. Almost half of Black Americans are single, compared with just over a quarter of white and a quarter of Hispanic Americans. As a result, Black Americans are disproportionately paying the singles penalty, along with a quarter of other taxpayers. My proposed solution is a repeal of the joint return, which only entered the code in 1948. It would immediately eliminate the marriage penalty and singles penalty currently being paid by hardworking Americans. No longer would their extra tax dollars subsidize certain married taxpayers that are disproportionately white. The repeal of the joint return would mean that Black Americans currently paying higher taxes would have more money available to save towards building wealth. My homeownership chapter, Black House White Market, showed the majority of white Americans are homeowners, while the majority of Black Americans are renters. According to the Census Bureau, the highest rate of homeownership is for white Americans at 74% and the lowest rate at Black Americans at 44%. As a result, all tax subsidies for homeownership will disproportionately benefit white Americans the most and Black Americans the least. Homeownership has been historically and remains an asset tied to racial identity. Recent data show that roughly one in 10 Americans itemize deductions, and those are disproportionately Americans with higher incomes. The mortgage interest deduction, which you can only take if you itemize deductions, is becoming increasingly irrelevant to most homeowners. But there are other tax subsidies for homeownership that includes the tax treatment for when we sell a home at a gain. Gains on sales of homes can escape taxation for up to half a million dollars if the taxpayer is married or a quarter of a million dollars if the taxpayer is single. Losses on the sale of a home, on the other hand, are not deductible. The special tax treatment for gain dates back to 1951. Now, by 1950, 
55% of white Americans had become homeowners. Just a decade earlier, only 44% of white Americans were homeowners. That explosive white homeownership growth was aided by low cost, long-term fixed interest rate mortgages insured by the federal government that largely excluded black Americans. From its origins, the tax break for gain on home sales was designed to benefit white homeowners. Established research shows that the, the greatest appreciation in our homes comes when we live in neighborhoods which are overwhelmingly white with very few black neighbors. As the percentage of black homeowners in the neighborhood increases, the value of the homes decrease, particularly because white home buyer preferences as the majority of home buyers help establish the market prices. While most white homeowners live in neighborhoods with very few black neighbors, the majority of black homeowners live in racially diverse or all black neighborhoods with many black neighbors. As a result, white homeowners, but not most black homeowners, are more likely to sell at a large tax-free gain. Research also shows that the homeowners most likely to sell their homes for a non-deductible loss are black. Tax subsidies for homeownership, therefore, create white tax winners and black tax losers. The federal government should stop subsidizing a racist homeownership market. We should repeal all tax subsidies for homeownership, period. My chapter on college, the great unequalizer showed how tax subsidies for higher education contribute to the black white racial wealth gap. Black college students leave college with more student loans than their white peers. The average black college graduate has $7,400 more in student loans than the average white college graduate. Four years after graduation, however, black Americans owe an average of $52,000 in student debt compared with $28,000 for white college graduates. And the gap is present across income levels. Not even wealthy black taxpayers can protect their children from higher student loan debt. Wealthy black parents cannot protect their students the way their white peers can. Their children have higher student loan balances than their white peers' children. That is true because wealthy black parents hold assets differently from their white peers. They have more invested in their homes and less invested in the stock market. In addition, direct plus loans, which have higher interest rates are also common among black families. But why does black college debt grow over time while white debt is reduced and paid off? Black college graduates are more likely to attend graduate school compared with their white peers and more likely to have graduate school debt. Any college debt repayments will be deferred while the student is in graduate school, increasing the principal balance over time. Coupled with income-based repayments, which black college graduates use almost twice as much as their white peers. While created with the best of intentions, deferred debt and income-based repayments are contributing to an ever-increasing black student debt problem and tax policy does not help matters here. The deduction for interest on student loan debt is limited to $2,500 per return and subject to income limits. By my calculations, with black debt at $53,000 and white student debt at $28,000, in the first few years, black Americans are more likely to be unable to deduct all of their interest because it exceeds the $2,500 limit. White Americans, on the other hand, are more likely to be eligible to deduct all of their interest. Student loan debt contributes to the racial wealth gap. Researchers have placed student debt at roughly 10% of the racial wealth gap when a college graduate is 25 years old, but by age 30 to 35, it explains about 25% of the gap. And I have two solutions. One, increase Pell Grants, and two, student debt forgiveness. According to the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, Pell Grants cover just 29% of the average cost of tuition, fees, room and board at public four-year colleges. 
far below the 79% it covered in 1975. Pell Grants have obviously not kept up with the rising cost of college. Pell Grants are awarded by income and roughly 70% of Black college students receive them compared with 34% of white students. Increasing the amount of Pell Grants should enable future generations of Black college students to graduate with significantly less debt. And the funding should come from a tax on not-for-profits with at least $750 million in endowment funds. I support targeted debt forgiveness for those in households with below median wealth. Debt forgiveness should also not, I'm sorry, should also include not just student debt, but parental debt, similarly to the way the Morehouse debt forgiveness program was structured. Congress must ensure that any forgiveness of student loan debt is tax-free for those whose debts have been forgiven. My chapter, The Best Jobs, shows that tax subsidies for employer-provided retirement accounts are more likely to benefit white workers. Occupational segregation in the labor market is the reason why. Retirement accounts as a tax benefit traces its roots to 1942, when price and wage controls, along with an excess profits tax, encouraged employers to provide non-wage benefits like retirement accounts. Amounts set aside in retirement accounts by employees, and if there's an employer match, amounts set aside by their employer are not taxable to the employee until their expected withdrawal at retirement. If any amounts are withdrawn prior to the age of 59 and a half, they are subject to an additional tax penalty. Black Americans are less likely than white Americans to work for employers that provide retirement accounts. In the private sector, for workers aged between 21 and 64, 56% of white workers work for an employer that offers a retirement plan, compared with 50% of Black workers and almost 35% of Hispanic workers. Almost 46 of white workers, almost 37% of Black workers, and only 25% of Hispanic workers actually participate in their private sector employer-provided retirement account. Research also suggests that Black workers are more likely than all other racial and ethnic groups to take an early withdrawal from their retirement accounts, regardless of income, and pay a tax penalty. One potential explanation could come from research that shows Black college graduates are more likely to send money home to their parents and other family members in financial distress, while white college graduates are more likely to receive money from their parents and other family members that enable them to be able to save more and build more wealth. Black college graduates have to make their dollars stretch farther than their white peers, which makes it less likely for them to be able to contribute to their retirement accounts and more likely to withdraw what they may have been able to contribute. Given that less than half of white workers, a little over a third of Black workers, and a quarter of Hispanic workers in the private sector participate in their retirement accounts, tax subsidies should be withheld from employers until the private sector increases their participation rates. My next chapter, Legacy, shows how tax subsidies for gifts and inheritances increases the Black-white wealth gap. The median household wealth of a white high school dropout is greater than the median wealth of a Black college graduate. Part of the explanation lies in family financial transfers. Research shows that gifts and inheritances explain about 5% of the racial wealth gap. That study followed families over a 25-year period and showed that white Americans were five times more likely to inherit than Black Americans. Among Black and white Americans who actually received an inheritance, white Americans received about 10 times more wealth than Black Americans. For each dollar inherited, white families were able to use 91% to increase their wealth, compared with only 20% used to increase Black wealth. 
One explanation is that Black Americans have extended family members who were alive during Jim Crow and received fewer opportunities to build wealth because of governmental racial discrimination that are supported by higher income Black family members. Black college graduates are more likely to send money to their parents, depleting their wealth, while white college graduates were more likely to receive money from their parents, enabling them to build wealth. Once again, tax policy exacerbates the racial wealth gap. Gifts and inheritances are received tax-free. Financial transfers by Black Americans to help support family members are not tax deductible. Those without wealth do not have tax breaks to help them build wealth. I believe tax-free family financial transfers helps explain why white households with a high school dropout have more wealth than that found in the households of Black college graduates. Gifts that lead to wealth building should be included in taxable income, but not gifts that cover family financial needs. The preferential rate for stock should also be repealed. We should tax income from labor the same way that we tax income from capital. My final chapter, What's Next, provides solution as well as recommendations for dealing with the current reality. My first recommendation you can already guess, the federal government needs to publish race and tax statistics. My ideal federal income tax system would have fewer deductions, fewer exclusions from income and fewer loopholes. All income would be taxed under progressive tax rate system. My ideal tax reform proposal would be the enactment of a reparations tax credit available to black Americans as compensation for the decades of higher taxes paid. It would be a refundable tax credit that would offset any taxes owed. And if the credit amount were greater than the taxes owed, the difference would be refunded to the taxpayer every April 15th. It is only an ideal because unfortunately, the Supreme Court would likely find the tax credit unconstitutional. But what the Supreme Court would find constitutional is a tax credit based upon wealth. So enter my second best proposal a refundable wealth tax credit that can help reduce the racial wealth gap. A refundable wealth tax credit would apply to all taxpayers living in U.S. households with below median wealth, which is roughly $100,000. A wealth tax credit would help low wealth taxpayers regardless of race and or ethnicity. And while it would help white taxpayers in low wealth households, the racial wealth gap means that the effect would disproportionately help black taxpayers because of the racial wealth gap. In 2016, 83% of black households had less net worth than the median for white households. So a refundable wealth tax credit is different from the earned income tax, tax credit in that it is measured by household wealth whereas the Earned Income Tax Credit is measured by income. In addition, while the Earned Income Tax Credit is extremely complicated, a wealth tax credit could be quite straightforward to implement. It would be a fixed amount that each taxpayer is eligible for, is eligible to receive, eliminating any possible confusion as to the amount of the, of the credit. If the taxpayer lives in a household with below median wealth, the taxpayer is eligible for the refundable wealth tax credit. It could be a tax credit that ends after a term of years or after the wealth gap decreases or continue in perpetuity. The idea of a refundable wealth tax credit is the important point and the actual details should allow for flexibility in order to obtain political support. A refundable wealth tax credit could help low wealth family members that are currently being supported by higher income relatives, which is relatively common among Black families. For far too long, Black Americans have paid higher taxes than their white peers, and fairness requires a significant change to the status quo. A refundable wealth tax credit would be a start. Now, am I optimistic about when he, whether any of my reforms will become a reality? In January 2021, President Biden signed a racial equity executive order calling for government agencies to disaggregate data by race. I would have expected Treasury and the IRS by now to have released some information on how they plan to proceed. 
The IRS commissioner has done nothing but suggest this is Treasury's job. Treasury, on the other hand, has made some initial moves. In October, Treasury appointed the first ever counselor for racial equity and announced plans to create a racial equity advisory committee at the Treasury Department. In mid-December of last year, Treasury announced that it would begin work on analyzing COVID relief payments by race. It's a start, but not a particularly ambitious one. I do have some reason for hope, but in the Government Accountability Office, they are moving forward with a race and tax project that I and several others were interviewed for last summer. Their report is scheduled to be released next month. While my scholarship was nurtured by the infrastructure at Cincinnati, Washington and Lee and Emory, most tax law professors in the wider legal academy ignored my research. The few who took notice did so generally in order to either insult or marginalize my work. One particular insult that I write about in the book occurred in January of 2002. I was a panelist on the tax section program at the Association of American Law Schools. I presented the marriage bonus penalty research that I was able to write because of the data analysis of the Institute for Policy Research. It was well received. The first audience question was directed at me. Dorothy, everybody knows your work is irrelevant because Blacks are poor and don't pay a lot in taxes. A hush fell over the crowd. The first person in my defense was a fellow panelist who said it was really important to understand whether tax policy has a racially disparate impact. The panelist told me later he didn't want me to be the first person to have to respond to that comment. Then it was my turn and I drew the microphone close and I said, well, if you're right, that means we want our children to grow up to be poor so they don't have to pay a lot in taxes. Well, the room cracked up and I said, no, what we want is our kids to grow up to have lots of income that is either subject to the low preferential rate or not taxed at all. To that tax professor, all Black Americans were poor when the overwhelming majority are not. That is one of the reasons why I wrote The Whiteness of Wealth, to show that the Black middle class and white middle class experienced two different Americas. Even if poverty were eliminated tomorrow, our separate but unequal middle-class reality would not change. So as I, as I close, I often think about how I got here. And I think about Sadia Hartman, the Columbia University professor and MacArthur Fellowship Grant awardee. She talked about finding freedom in her colleagues' low expectations. She stated, as a Black woman intellectual, I'm at the bottom of the food chain. But within that space of no one taking me seriously, there was all this space to work. Her comments resonate with me. I have been toiling in the race and tax field for 25 years, marginalized, ignored, and insulted. Nevertheless, I persisted. My work being ignored gave me the space to produce the whiteness of wealth. My book shows that you cannot tackle the racial wealth gap without transforming our tax policies. My aim has never been to impress scholars, but to change the world. And right now, from where I'm sitting, I like my odds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy. That was wonderful. It's so fun to, to hear about it all after talking about it for all that time. A hundred years. But, um, yeah, not quite a hundred, but a few. It takes a while to get a book to put it out in the world. Um, I'm going to take a moment to introduce Phil Bowman, who is then going to be in conversation with um, Professor Brown, and then we will take questions from the audience. Um, Dr. Bowman is currently a professor of higher education at the University of Michigan, where he's also the director of the former director of the Diversity Research and Policy Program, as well as a faculty associate at the Institute for Social Research and the National Poverty Center. His scholarship focuses on race and ethnic diversity, higher education and related policy issues, including workplace opportunity, urban poverty, family distress and health inequities. 
He's also taking national leadership and pushing conversations about strengths-based interventions to reduce inequities and, um, and provide opportunity and close opportunity gaps. Um, I'm lucky to have known him for over 20 years now. He is the ultimate intellectual and scholar, just deeply and sincerely interested in the world and people's stories and understanding why things are the way way they are and how to transform them in ways that create opportunity. He's also an immensely generous colleague um, and friend and a model for me and many others of what it means to operate with um, humanity and integrity in the world. So I'm very, very glad he could be here with us today and I'll turn it over to him and Dorothy. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Well, first of all, I'd like to just say that um, I'm ex extremely, extremely impressed with uh, the uh, profound uh, contributions that uh, Professor Brown's work uh, has made. I'm, I'm, uh, I've just begun. I haven't read the entire book, but I have started the process, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really a transformative uh, piece of, of scholarship. You know that, as you indicate, has uh, even more implications for um, uh, activism and policy. You know, so I want to just personally applaud you, you know, for you. Uh, for this um, uh, cutting edge, cutting edge scholarship. And uh, I haven't had a chance to meet you personally yet, but I've heard a lot about you, you know, not only <laughs> through uh, Tyrone and uh, Amanda, but also, uh, as you know, uh, my daughter, who's a law professor at Georgetown University. Uh, just yes. raves about you and your work, you know. So my girl, that's my girl, Jamila. <laughs> yes. Yep. So it's my it's my personal personal pleasure, you know, to uh, you know have you uh, present this Bowman lecture and learn, you know, personally, and uh, again uh, provide an opportunity for the audience to learn about this extremely important work. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thanks for being in conversation with me. And uh, you know, I uh, um, you know just to kind of lay out a, 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 an initial issue, you know, not so much uh, a question, but, uh, you know, one of the things I begin to think about is um, the, the, the obvious implications of your work at the federal, you know, policy level with taxes uh, and federal taxes. Uh, and, and, and again, that speaks for itself. I was just, you know, also thinking, or, or just, uh, you know, thinking out loud about uh, the implications for urban policy. Yes. Uh, you know, the implications for, you know, since, uh, you know, African Americans are in, increasingly uh, in cities, yes. in urban areas, uh, you know, Chicago, uh, mm -hmm. Atlanta, mm -hmm. yep. uh, Detroit, you know, and even the District of Columbia, although right. you know, it's formerly not a city, but we just certainly disproportionately, you know, operate in those spaces. And I was just kind of curious, you know, about uh, your thinking uh, about the multi level implications of this work, you know, at the federal and how it also manifests itself, certainly in urban spaces. Oh, absolutely. And what we're seeing now, we're seeing, for example, Republican governors are talking about cutting taxes at the high end, but raising taxes at the low end. So as, as bad as we see it in the federal tax area, it's also bad in the state income tax area for different reasons. But there's certainly a lot of work that needs to be done in the state space to mirror what I've done in the federal space, because there's, uh, you know, you often see state tax laws are not very progressive. They tend to be very regressive. So, yes, absolutely. There's a lot of work to be done um, because once, you know, we see how bad it is at the federal level. Well, then that can also be replicated because a lot of states have their tax policies from the federal so they just carry over what the federal does into their state income tax system. So yes, it 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 multiplies. And your work really provides a template, right? Yes, you know, it to, could. Uh, to to kind of build on the the questions and the kind of critical issues as well as the strategies. So you know, so th that's another part about you know I think about the important contributions of your of your work. You know, how to yes. fix it. Right, you know, exactly. that, 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 you know, you you don't only lay out a profound analysis of these issues, right. but you really lay out very concrete, practical strategies for addressing them. Right, you know, and 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 you really so so there's a there's a a, a lot of opportunity to pass the baton, you know, That's or right. to work, you know, uh, uh, and 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 uh, kind of work uh, in a consultative or or collaborative capacity with others who might want to drill down, 
you know, at the, right. uh, at, the at the state and local level to kind of, you know, because because what you're saying, if I'm understanding this correctly, is those same processes are at work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've had various states reach out to me to talk about tax policy. So, yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, so that was that was one of the major, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, issues. I also was struck by, you know, this reparations issue, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I noticed you uh, made some reference to uh, the work on stratification economics. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, I immediately thought about the work of Dark Hamilton and uh, yes. Sandy and, Darity. Yes. You know, uh, and at, Kristen uh, Mullen's book. Yes. And, and, and exactly all, you know, all those economists who, you know, so could you talk a little bit more about, you know, uh, uh, about that? I was just kind of uh, curious, you know, about your thinking about their work and uh, the intersections. So, you know, one of the things I like about the stratification economists, as opposed to the typical economists, is they recognize racism is real, right? So your typical economist assumes away racism as well as many other things, whereas stratification economists take into account the reality that race matters. And one of the earlier one of the earliest pieces I read was a co-authored piece by Derek Hamilton, where he drilled down into this notion that Black middle-class Americans are more likely to be sending money to family members. Mm -hmm. So that, that research really opened my eyes in terms of thinking, how did we get here? And, and what does that look like? And because you're born into a system that depletes you of wealth because of larger societal racism, it's almost impossible for you to build wealth because you are worried about a relative being evicted or you're worried about a relative having their lights turned off. Or you're, so it's, you know, that's that part of his research really explained a lot as I as I wrote the book. And I got to bug Derek a lot. He's a he's a friend and a really good guy. So I I whenever I'd have some harebrained idea about economics, I said, "Okay, Derek, does this make sense?" So yes. So <laughs> yeah, that's that's no, that's that's uh that's great. So th those were two of the really you know kind of um, uh, salient issues. The the other you know thing, and and this one is a bit more remote, but uh you know there's this you know uh, issue of uh, police and policing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and inequalities. I also heard that you have done some thinking about that issue. And is, are there any intersections, you know, uh, between this work and that work that you uh, also, I know, have thought about? And of course, it's a pressing, you know, societal issue now, you know, especially with the way in which systemic racism, you know, has manifested itself in that, in that space in a very salient, you know, uh, 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 way at this uh, stage of history. So, you know, one of the things I think about is this idea that, you know, who pays for the police? Taxpayers pay for the police. Some of those taxpayers are black taxpayers. We pay for the police that then kill us, right? We pay for to the police to over-police us. We pay for these services, but they don't look at us as the people they care about providing good service to. So when I think about, you know, policing and taxes, I think about, I pay your salary but I'm scared to death when you pull me over. And something's wrong with that picture that I am paying for brutality, mm -hmm. right? And nobody ever makes that connection. But mm -hmm. we taxpayers pay state and local taxes that go for police salaries. And we have an absolute right to demand better service. Yeah, and 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 to that to that degree, it it's it's uh, the flip side of that also means because we pay taxes, that ought to give us some authority, and some and some power, not only the right, you know, but some type of a uh, political oversight. Um, oversight, yes. you know, yes. uh, you know, it would be different if uh, we didn't have that. We would be on the outside speaking in, but right. in some ways, we're clearly insiders, you know, given that we're that we're that we're taxpayers. That also, you know, ought to be you know some basis to mobilize around. Absolutely. And Black people are not thought of as taxpayers. 
Black people are thought of as people who take services and don't pay taxes, right? Yeah. So when I think about the New Deal and I think about the federal government that excluded Black Americans from the GI Bill, from FHA insured loans, as World War II was financed, guess what? It was financed by making more Americans pay taxes. So before World War II, the only people who paid taxes were the richest Americans. But because we had to pay for the war, at the by the time World War II was over, at least 85% of Americans were paying taxes. And many of those Americans were Black Americans. So Black Americans are funding a federal government that is excluding them from federal programs. So we see this time and time and time again. We pay taxes. We don't get services. But we're told we don't pay taxes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's insidious. You know, and, and you mentioned it. You know, I, I just, you know, think back to your point about your uh, uh, panel presentation. Yes. And the insult from the audience, you yes. know, uh, uh, with... Which, which really raises this whole questions about these, um, you know, the, the impact in this space of these stereotypes. Yes. You know, that, that, that versus facts. That's right. You know, that, that uh, you know, not only did it manifest itself in that, in that insult to you, but it currently seems to be an impediment, you know, in the policy space because you know, people assume so much. That's right. You know, that, uh, 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 and, you know, the challenge to social change is how do you interrogate and challenge those stereotypes with facts in a space that are very resistant, you know, to the facts? Very resistant. And the media, the, the media, the tax coverage by the media is also very bad. They get class, but they don't get race with, with limited exceptions. So it's, you know, we think about the ProPublica series where they, they talked about billionaires paying lower taxes than middle class Americans, and they had pictures. And all the pictures were white guys. <clears throat> and not once did they mention race. Not once did they mention, you know, Jeff Bezos could become a Jeff Bezos because he was born a white guy. But if he, if he was born Jamal Brown, he's not going to be Jeff Bezos. He's not going to have Jeff Bezos level wealth because our system of building wealth is racialized. So it, it's, you know, and, and people think that ProPublica is like this, doing this really good service, but they are fostering the narrative that it's all class and not race. And it's really troublesome when people who are trying to push the needle don't get the race piece, it hides behind this colorblind notion and there's nothing colorblind about tax law, nothing. Yeah, I was just thinking about that, you know, as you spoke, you know, that it also raises as a, uh, as a challenge and a barrier in this space, you know, the work by, you know, scholars like Eduardo Bonita Silva yes. and, and Larry Bobo yes. on systemic racism, you yes. know, and, and the depth of that and, and insidious nature of that systemic racism manifesting itself in spaces like this because yes. that's what i'm hearing you know that, that that part of that resistance and part of that you know so-called you know colorblind you know a, a kind of laissez-faire or 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 colorblind mm -hmm. approach to this is really embedded deeply in 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 those versions of racism absolutely so eduardo's racism without racist i do an excerpt of his um of that book in my critical race theory introduction chapter and yeah, it's like, how is it that Black Americans wind up behind in all these different instances? Well, I, I don't, uh, yeah, it must have something to do with them because we're not right. racist. We don't wear white hoods. We don't, we don't use the N-word. It can't be us when really it's systems that operate on autopilot and you have to, you know, figuratively blow up the system if you're going to make change because it's on all it pilot doing its thing, which leaves Black Americans behind while rewarding white Americans and yeah. telling Black Americans, oh, you're doing something wrong. You just need to pull up your pants. That's you right. need to work harder. You need to go to school. You need to get married. You know, and all these tropes we see uh, no, Black people do all those things, check all those boxes, and we still fall further and further behind. Yeah, and yet the default is some, there must be something wrong with Blacks. There must yes. be something that is that deficit or that social pathology 
a set of stereotypes. That's right, because we have the civil right. We have all these laws. You can't discriminate right. on the basis of race. So it must be black people. Nah, not really. It's a system that's anti-black. <laughs> exactly, which which in some ways then, you know, uh, really does, you know, uh, speak to the importance of looking at your work in the broader context of the challenges raised by those kind, the, you know, the, the scholars, you know, such as, you know, Ed, Eduardo, uh, Bonita yes. Silva, and Larry Bobo and others, you yes. know, who, who uh, kind of lay out, you know, you know, systemically and systematically the historical and contemporary manifestations of that, you know, Absolutely. and this seems to be one, sp one space, you know, where, you know, almost everything that you've said, you know, uh, suddenly suggested that it's rearing its ugly head, you know, yet yes. again, you know, in ways that impede the kind of practical uh, uh, work, and that you know the, the the final comment I'll make. You know, you mentioned that that the Biden administration has begun to at least uh, embrace some of these ideas. You know, so you know that that is also the kind of ebb and flow of partisan politics, right? Yes. That yes. That, that that you know uh, at the federal level and at the local level that 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 also continues to you know be a challenge for us. You know, to make yes. inroads in this regard. Absolutely, absolutely. So you know, every time I get asked. You know, I say something about the Biden administration could do better. And every now and then, not every now and then, then they'll reach out to me. <laughs> and, you know, Dorothy, let's have a conversation. I'm yeah. like, OK, I just want the data. Don't, you know, we can have a conversation. But until you show me the data, I, you, you're wasting your time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, appreciate that. Um, I, I enjoy this so much. I, I, I I wish we could, we could just go on and on. Well, we have some questions from the audience, and I'm I'm hoping Phil that you'll stick around because I think you might have. Oh, some absolutely! I, uh, I look forward to to hearing that 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 uh, you know certainly how the audience is thinking about these issues. Yeah. Um, so there's some big questions and some very specific questions, and I'll just take them as they as they came in. And excuse my dog who's joining in the conversation in the background. I don't know if you can hear him. The dog is giving us a question. Exactly. <laughs> Um, we have one question from one of our colleagues, David Merriman, who said, you suggest that we should eliminate joint federal tax returns. Recent research shows that a significant portion of the recent increase in income inequality is the result of a sort of mating, basically high income individuals marrying each other. Because of this, the joint income of married couples can often be nearly double the income of the highest earning member of the couple. Because of this, could eliminating the joint return make it more difficult to implement a progressive income tax system? That's, so that's very wonky. So I'm, I'm glad. Yes. You <laughs> so here's my response. Yeah. First of all, most Black Americans aren't married. So let's talk about who we're helping with a joint return. We're helping white people way more than we're helping Black people because most Black Americans aren't married. So that's number one. Number two, when we talk about a sort of mating and who's marrying and who, it's not Black people. For the most part, you're talking about white college grads, right? So I've seen research that talks about, you know, white college grads or marrying white college grads, whereas, you know, 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. Um, we're not seeing that replicated to the same extent in the Black community. So when we talk about progressive, I want to add a racial lens to it. So... And my focus is on helping most Black Americans, not like the minority of Black Americans who have done X, Y, or Z. Um, so I'm not convinced that a return to our, so let me also say, at the very beginning of our progressive income tax system, there was single filing, there was no marriage filing. So we had a progressive system without the joint return. So I'm saying, let's go back to what it was like then. So, so yes, you know, you would find two high income white Americans making roughly equal amounts. And if they both stayed in the labor market, they would be subject to marriage penalties, assuming the 2017 tax act provisions go away, which they will. Um, yes, but I can honestly say that's a white phenomenon more than it is a black phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, question number two. Um, how can Black homeowners build equity in Black communities if they do not move to mostly white neighborhoods or suburbs? You've written about this for years. So I, I <laughs> yes. you, and you. this is the research that got white progressive academics the angriest at me. Like, like, you know, red meat, they, they lost their you know what when I would present this research. Um, so here's what I tell people. 
One, when you want to be a homeowner, if you're a Black American, be intentional. You can decide to buy in a racially diverse or all black neighborhood, but recognize that it's not going to give you the return if you bought in an all white neighborhood or with the only black family in all white neighborhood. Now, there are negatives of being the only black family in an all white neighbor neighborhood, not a financial negative. The negative is your white neighbor calls the cops on you. Your, when your kid goes to school, they see your kid as a dis discipline problem when he's just doing what all the other kids are doing. So, there, so if you decide to live in an all black or racially diverse neighborhood, do not put all your money in your home. Buy a home, but do not be house poor. Second, do not, do not, do not take out a home equity loan because you just don't know how much your home is gonna appreciate. Mm -hmm. So with the money you don't put into your home, put it into your retirement account put it into the stock market, do other things to diversify your portfolio and not put all of it into your home. So there's a way to be smart and buy in a black neighborhood. It's just behaving differently than you would in an all white neighborhood where you can be house poor, where you can take out home equity loans because the price is going up, 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 up. Mm. So remember that piece you wrote in Forbes about that a while ago. I'm sure. Yes. Trouble. Yeah. 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 About that. Um, okay. Uh, hi, Professor Brown. This person says, we're reading your book in Professor Kelly Carter's tax policy and inequality class at, at Loyola Law School. Given the strict scrutiny requirements, again, question I'm not sure I understand, but I'm glad you're here. Um, given the strict stru scrutiny requirements that you mentioned that would likely render race-based tax policy unconstitutional, what are other factors that can be used to create an equitable tax system? Also, second question, is there a specific focus on the type of equity, horizontal or vertical or something else that the tax code should explicitly move towards? Okay, so the fact that strict scrutiny says you can't make a law that targets for better or worse, black Americans does not mean you can't take race into account when you make tax policy. So it, you know, the law does not say we have to ignore race. The law says that, that when we consider race, it isn't the only thing, which is why the reparations tax credit that would only go to black Americans would get struck down. So I don't believe there is any other factor that is a proxy for race. Zip code doesn't do it, you know, surname doesn't do it. Re Nothing other than race. So I think when we talk about tax policy, we should have a racial impact statement that tells us the impact this law is going to have on the racial wealth gap, the impact the law is going to have on different racial and ethnic groups, and there's nothing to prevent Congress from doing that. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Um, and wealth is not a suspect class. So if we make tax law based on wealth, that's going to disproportionately benefit Black Americans because of the racial wealth gap. And the Supreme Court has said, eh, you could discriminate on the basis of wealth. So we could have a tax system that dealt with wealth a lot more than income. So that's one thing. And in terms of, you know, horizontal or vertical equity, I th and, and horizontal equity is two households, let's say making $50,000, should pay the same amount in taxes. We don't have horizontal equity today because if I make $50,000 from my job and you make $50,000 from stock, you're going to pay a whole lot less in taxes than I am. So we don't have horizontal equity. We should. We should tax income from stock the same way as income from labor, but we don't. And then vertical um, equity says the household that makes $75,000 should pay more than the household that makes $50,000, right? So, you know, vertical equity is the classic explanation for why we have a progressive tax rate system, that as income goes up, tax rates should go up and people making higher income have a greater ability to pay, so they should pay more. So yeah, we should think about those concepts, but we should not think about the concepts the way they're taught today. We should think about those concepts in the context of systemic or structural racism in America. You can't talk about a $50,000 job 
all $50,000 jobs are not created equal. So what horizontal equity would say is, oh, they're all the same. Well, no, they're not. One mm -hmm. might come with tax-free benefits and one doesn't. That We don't have the same ability to pay. So I think those concepts are helpful, but as they've been interpreted and applied, they, they allow us to ignore the very real the, the very real factor that taxpayers bring their racial identities onto their tax returns. Hmm. Interesting. Um, there's a um, question here um, about, I think you answered this a little bit, is there good racial and ethnic data on state taxes? You know, there are some states that are, so the easy answer is I'm not sure. There are some states that are try they're in the process of doing this work so i would imagine over the next year or so we're going to see although now that i say it there's this organization that the initials are itep they have put out i don't know what it stands for but itep has put out reports looking at race and tax on the state level property taxes if i remember correctly so yeah there actually is some data on that mm -hmm. Now, is there, when we're talking about this, because I was thinking when, when Phil is asking about urban policy, I think about there's property taxes, yes. there's state income taxes, there are um, sales tax, which we already know is a kind of regressive, regressive. tax. Yep. Uh, yeah. So how do you think about the matrix of all that? I mean, I know obviously income tax is the biggest um, one, but if you were going to like beyond income tax, what are the, because I think you're, you're so beautifully capturing like exactly how structural racism works. And so I'm wondering, you know, how, how all the rest of that fits into that matrix. So, you know, the interesting thing, because in an earlier life, I taught state and local law and state and local finance. So here's what I know. States and cities can't just raise taxes because they think it's a good idea. They can't do what the federal government does. They are limited in what they can raise taxes in. And states have more of more authority to raise taxes from a variety of different contexts. Local government cities, not so much. Mm -hmm. So local governments are limited in what they can do. Some cannot have an income tax. Some cannot increase property taxes without a referendum. Some have to you know, jump through hoops. So part of it is the law itself limits what a city can do. And cities do what they've always done. So if they're allowed to have sales taxes, they just have more sales taxes. If they're allowed to have property taxes, they just have more property taxes. So when I think about school funding, right? So the biggest contribution to local school districts is local property taxes. Very little dollars come from the federal and more than federal, but much less than the local are state dollars. But we've already seen what racial segregation and home ownership does. So the schools most in need have the lowest value property and they can't raise the money, but they are limited in what levers they can push as revenue sources. So that in and of itself is a problem. And then when you look at the kinds of taxes that they do have, property taxes, have historically been discriminatory, and we have studies that show they continue to be discriminatory. Um, and sales taxes, the poor pay a higher percentage of their income on sales taxes. The things that low-income Americans need to buy are more heavily taxed than the things that aren't. So yes, everything we've seen in the federal income tax, you could say it's on steroids at the state and local. One, because they're constrained. Federal government, they can print money. They can issue debt. They can do anything. Not the states, not the cities, not the other local units. So they're really constrained in how they can raise money. And they're limited to these historical structures like property taxes that have been discriminatory from day one. Although it reminds me also about some of the, you're making me think about some of the recent work about um, practices around fines and fees and ticketing. You know, a lot of the research that started with some of the, with Ferguson. Ferguson. Yeah. And has come out. We actually had a former postdoc here, Casey Hendricks, who looked at the, the black. Oh, the I know his work. Yes. Yeah. But the blacker the municipality, the more likely they are to, to try to bl plug um, budget holes through uh, aggressive kind of fines and fees and that sort of thing. 
Yes, yes. And Ferguson really brought that to the forefront when you looked at the budget and how much was based on fines, traffic fines and fees. You're like, okay, this is just wrong, wrong and wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Um, clearly, this information needs to get to a broad audience so that we can begin to change the perception of who pays the most taxes and begin to change the policies. Have you had success in reaching out of the academic world to discuss your research? Uh, well, you know, yes, <laughs> I'd say yes. Clearly, there's more that needs to be done. Yeah. Um, the paperback comes out later this month. So I'll be, you know, you know, on TV again. Um, but yeah, the, you know, there's always more that could be done. And putting pressure on the Biden administration needs to be done, as well as, and I do think the GAO report is going to be useful in a number of contexts, one of which is how is it the GAO was able to do it and Treasury hasn't yet, right? So I think part of the moves that Treasury made at the end of last year and into this year was because we all knew the GAO report was coming out. And if you're Treasury, you don't want GAO to beat you. So you have this press announcement. And actually, they invited me and some others, went to DC for a meeting at Treasury, and you know, they made this announcement, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I think the feet, you know, the um, the administration's feet needs to be held to the fire because we see other government agencies like housing and urban development and, and um, transportation, they're doing more things in the racial equity space than Treasury is. You know, Treasury, you know, it's kind of checking boxes. Okay, you check the box, now what are you doing? So, you know, time will tell, but I, I totally agree. You know, I need to get out more. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, I, I, you know, I, I do think it's one of these things, you know, how do you turn a big ship really slowly, right? So what I'm learning is to be patient and I clearly I am, I've been on this bandwagon for a hundred years, right? So um, I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm pleased with the reception that I'm getting. People are listening and wanting, you know, getting angry, reading the book, getting angry and wanting to do, do something. And I, I tell people, whenever you hear anybody talking about taxes, ask the follow-up question about race. If they can't answer you, then move on to somebody else. Um, which are the, I mean, I know you talked about data being a big thing, but of the other recommendations that you've made, which, which of the others do you think has gotten the most traction so far, or at least the most receptivity, I would say? The wealth tax credit. So mm -hmm. I did a webinar. I presented it at a Federal Reserve um, program and the Federal Reserve president of, of the St. Louis Fed like made a point of all the proposals shouting mine out. And I think it's because it applies to everybody, mm -hmm. right? If you're low wealth and you know we're in a moment of wealth inequality and this would help. So I think that has the most, you know, it's it's classic interest convergence from mm -hmm. Derek Bell. It's classic everybody would benefit. So I think that has the most um, potential for traction. Just, you know, judging by how excited he was when I started talking, I'm like, oh, somebody's excited about it, okay. So, and, and I understand why, because it would apply to anybody in a low wealth household, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question we have here that I don't understand, but hopefully you will. Um, do you feel, if state infrastructure would change their pension problems to something more similar to a 401k or IRA, that would be a better way to distribute state resources more effectively to everyone or effectively cut those taxes in the first place. So I'm assuming the alternative is a defined benefit plan mm -hmm. where you get X amount of dollars at retirement. I tend to think defined benefit plans are better than all others. I think they're better than 401ks and IRAs because defined benefit plan puts the burden on the state to invest the money because they guarantee you a salary when you retire. And if the state screws up, they still got to pay. Whereas if we put you know, we have 401ks, or if you're a uh, work at an education institution, 403Bs or IRAs, we are in charge of the investment decisions. And if we make a bad decision and we wind up at retirement with zero money in our account, we're out of luck. So it, if I'm understanding the question, I like defined benefit plans, which is the state agrees to pay you X dollars at retirement for life. 
and they take all the investment risk and they're in a better position than the individual plan members are. So that's the right answer. I have, I have one more question. I'm gonna put it to both of you from, from the audience and then I'll give you a minute to, to say some final comments. So this question is, um, person wrote, um, they're, they're thinking about how easily the government handed out funding during the pandemic. You know, and in some ways showing yes. that it's not a question of not having funding, but the will to move to support different communities. And what do you think the possibility is? How can you imagine, um, you, you know, particularly black communities have been harmed so long by racist policies. What would it take to kind of rally that kind of investment to, to bridge some of these gaps, structural gaps you've been talking about? So to me, it'd be really easy. It would be substituting a couple of democratic senators who are in there out and putting in two others. I mean, honestly, we're really close. So part of it, you know, when I think about how the expiration of the expanded child tax credit, you know, immediately put children back in poverty when they had been, you know, 40% of 40% cut in the poverty rate. Who on earth wants kids, babies to go to bed hungry, right? So Right now, we have a couple of Democratic senators who don't have a problem with babies going to bed hungry. And to me, the answer is we need to, to replace them or increase the numbers so that we actually have 50 votes for that. And we, you know, we, we're close. So I'm, you know, I, who knows what happens right at the midterms. But when we think about it, if we actually had 50 real Democrats, we'd be able to build back better would have been passed. So to me, to me, the problem isn't one of lack of support. It's we're just a couple of votes short. That's very optimistic. I know who to thunk it. I know. Phil, what's your thoughts on that? On, on you, know, you, know, you know, I go back to, you know, the, at, 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 at some level, I'm a student of Frederick Douglass and a, you know, a fan, but where there is no struggle, there is no progress. Mm -hmm. You know, power concedes nothing without demand. You never has and never will. You know, that at some level, you know, these things are responsive. You know, so as much as we can do, you know, to uh, charge the uh, congressman, you know, Congressional Black Caucus, you know, for example, yes, yes. Or, or, or other political, you know, actors uh, at the local level, you know, at the state level, at the federal level, you know, that, that, that history, you know, is taught that that's when you get response, that you don't get response in the absence of it, mm -hmm. you know, you know, so, uh, and, and, and uh, in, this, in this current moment of, of uh, the Black Lives Matter, Matter movement, for example, you know, you do get a groundswell, you know, mm -hmm. so to me, you know, we need leadership, you know, we need, you know, kind of a, 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 a interest convergence. You know, you need the, you know, the kind of strategic uh, a, a, a work with allies. But at the end of the day, you know, um, um, you know, I think we need to understand that without push, you will get no response. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to throw. A, I missed one question from the audience, and then I, I, I'm going to give you a chance, Dorothy, to say any final thoughts you have. The last one was your idea of taxing the endowments of nonprofits is a very interesting one. How do you buy the taxing nonprofits as opposed to taxing a different set of institutions? Say that again. How did I? How did you arrive at the oh. idea of taxing nonprofits? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's nonprofit educational institutions. It's like institutions like Emory. It's like institute, right? It's, it's higher ed that has done, that's part of the problem. So I, it was easy for me. We want to increase Pell Grants. And the reason we need to increase Pell Grants is these elite institutions with billions of dollars of endowment are not doing anything to increase the diversity in their student body. So over the last 30 years, there's been very little movement. Exactly right. But, but in exchange for that, they have this tax exemption. And I'm like, hold up, wait a minute. This tax exemption, you, we should hold you accountable for that. And you should be ashamed of the fact that over the last 30 years, there's been very little movement. Therefore, I believe, fine, you don't want to do any better? We're going to tax you so that we, the federal government, could do better and more fully fund Pell Grant. So for me, it was a, the, the elite institutions, and they're the ones with the more than $750 million endowment. And how did I pick 750? 
I looked at all the HBCUs <laughs> and I looked at what's the most an HBCU had, and it was less than 750. So I said, I'm going with 750 because I don't want HBCUs paying this, paying a dime for this. Um, because they're punching above their weight in terms of admitting uh, underrepresented uh, students. So for me, it was easy. The elite institutions need to pay for their tax exemption because they're not doing anything. So they're having their their students graduate with all this debt. Mm -mm, mm -mm. So that that was very easy. Um, was there was there a second part? Just about no, just about which institutions? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking um, we're, we're having an event in a few weeks with a local organization called the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability. They just published a report showing that Illinois had, has basically, the support for public higher education in the state has declined by half over wow. the last 20 years. Um, wow. And we just published a report on, on middle-class wealth gaps in the city, racial wealth gaps. And the student loan debt issue that you're talking about is so prevalent that there's like a very, there's a, oh, there's a moment right here in Illinois to kind of think concretely about what needs to happen. Speaking of which, Tyrone Foreman put in the in the chat, defined benefits will work everywhere but in Illinois. So we'll, you know, we'll see what that, what that we'll see how relevant things are for the state of Illinois. Um, but Dorothy, I just, and Phil, I wanted to thank you both. I, we have like about two minutes left. I didn't know either you had a final thought you wanted to share um, before we, you know, there's a kind of an abrupt close here because we closed the Zoom, but I wanted to give you a chance to say. Yeah, I just wanted to just uh, uh, thank uh, Professor Dorothy Brown again for just a wonderful presentation and also just for her uh, scholarship and activism. You know, she's exemplary, you know, in terms of a scholar doing cutting edge work, but at the end of the day, also, you know, making sure that work is translated into um, efforts for social change. So, you know, uh, I really personally appreciate you and uh, you know, you know, certainly, uh, you know, look forward to seeing your uh, work go forward, you know, in your career. Thank you. And I just want to say, tax policy is a civil rights issue. Mm -hmm. That's a profound okay. issue. That's a profound statement. But I think it's a it's a good way to close it. In that regard, the struggle does continue. Yes. Absolutely. And you are one of the few people I know who could make tax policy interesting, Dorothy. So we, <laughs> we, so, we so appreciate both of you and have, have really learned a lot from this conversation. So thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for joining us today. We look forward to continuing this work. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye.